Sorry to drag you away from moving machinery. I know you mechies like that sort of thing. Uh, here are the contact details. I'll, um, I'll, I'll distribute these slides and here's some small bits of details about the, uh, the printers. I'll also uh, distribute Finn's presentation. Um, try not to overload his uh, uh, mailbox, but um, if you have a, a CAD file, I believe send it to him with some uh, little bit of information around it. Um, in addition, to these rapid prototypers, we have the uh, kind of fabrication and manufacturing suite here. So if you need something with slightly more durable uh, properties or made on a slightly larger scale, uh, you'd contact uh, this guy, Jan Frank uh, Pedersen. And the way you'd do that is you'd uh, produce some engineering drawings and 3D sketches of parts, go speak to him about them straight away so he can think about which production technologies are the best to make your uh, components and he'd also give you some advice about how to redesign them so that they can better be made. Uh, you then print them out on paper and discuss them uh, at the earliest opportunity and then send him the, uh, the drawings and discuss a plan of work. So if you need something slightly bigger, which is slightly more durable and workable, uh, you'd contact Frank and he could also order the materials for you. So the point is uh, obviously everybody's really interested and excited that these, these things can print stuff and you can get things made, but you can get carried away with that. What you need to think is what would you use these for? Don't print your parts just for the sake of it. Print them as prototypes so that you can test something as we've been talking about in this lecture. So from the design and innovation program, I'm not sure if you know the student who came up with these sketches, but here's a, a typical proof of principle prototype. So it's, a, it's an idea that uh, you push down uh, on these skates and it basically translates the movement into rotation movement and it'll move you forward. Now this is a typical type of thing you might want to do a proof of principle of the mechanisms. Maybe you don't need it load bearing, maybe you could do it reduced size, but you could print some cogs off and try it out uh, just on your rabbit or whatever you have. It doesn't have to be functional prototyping, doesn't have to be done on these types of printers or in solid material. Here's a, a nice example of paper prototyping. Oh, yeah. So. Got it? No, I think you need to turn the sound on, sorry. Oh, is it sound right? Yeah. It's in movie mode. So it just needs to take off the edge. Oh, okay. Thank you. It's a restaurant, it's a restaurant. It's the first time we've been to the bar, so you've got to be. So this is somebody uh, designing a mobile phone app to navigate uh, for someone who's arriving at the town called Bath for the first time, this is where I was before I came to uh, Denmark, incidentally. And to do that, they created a very simple paper prototype. You arrive in Bath, and you're looking for a restaurant to eat at. It's the first time you've been to Bath, so your navigation is towards half a What would you choose? It's, uh, it's a... So you get a picture. You don't need to do physical embodiments, perhaps to prove your principle that you're after, all you need to do is produce a paper prototype. It really depends what question you're asking. So do as much as you need to do to prove or validate the question you're asking. Don't bother doing more than that. Here's some uh, prototypes uh, I created when I was uh, designing my uh, art locking device. Um, I think these were um, SLA parts, um, 
just on a powder resin, putting them together. Um, and I was essentially producing proof of principle. So I had several variations of lock in terms of uh, how I'd like them to embody. Um, obviously, I didn't in anticipate they'd look like this eventually, but it was just to prove the principle. Um, and for, I basically thought that this was the principle that was going to be most valuable. But after doing these prototypes, I always managed to evaluate them on all different types of criteria, such as how did concept one relate to assembly? And it turned out it was very awkward. How did it allow you to adjust the, uh, the code, uh, so the combination locks? And it turned out that you couldn't do a combination lock with this style device because it needed two smaller increments. Um, it turned out that the code could be revealed underneath the tube uh, when it's attached to the frame. It was a little bit more flimsy than I anticipated. Uh, uh, lock insecure, I don't know what that meant, sorry. Um, on a positive side, it was a little bit more discreet than I anticipated. Um, and um, it could be an uh, effective visual deterrent. So to begin with, I actually thought this was the, the type of mechanism that I was going to go ahead with. After just doing these simple prototypes based on SLA machines, I had a complete re-evaluation of what was important in these devices. Um, I ended up going with this, uh, this principle. Then you have to think about how you're going to make your prototypes. Uh, and it's not the same production. Um, for example, my, uh, one of the brackets for my design was going to be an extruded part, parted off, and then uh, machined afterwards. Um, that's very hard to do when you're just prototyping, making one-off mock-ups. For example, I'd need, you'd need a very long T-cutter to come in and cut this groove, and it's just not feasible. So you have to think about, can you manufacture it through other means? So my prototype was made through fabrication, and we tried another version where we just welded the top point so we could make it in, in several steps. And again, uh, in the final design, I anticipated this bracket would clip on here but again, we'd need an extrusion or this to be T-cut, whereas we thought for the prototype it would be enough to have it U-shaped and then just screwed on to mount. So make sure it's easy to put together, but doesn't uh, sacrifice what the, the intended function was going to be. Uh, here was my probably about Mark V prototype, and this was both proof of principle and form. I needed to make sure at this stage uh, the device could fit behind um, the brackets of, of the frames of the artwork, but also it could put together and be used properly. Um, and this was my Mark IX prototype, which was the, one of the final ones that we decided this was the, the real working principle that we wanted to go for. Um, but it, it changed quite a lot from this stage, just from the learnings through producing these prototypes. Um, we can see here... I managed to mount it on frames, got the adequate thickness, made sure on a standard frame that it was completely uh, secluded behind the frame. Um, and this was a, a enough for us to decide to go into uh, batch production. So here's another project, the RepRap project, already uh, um, announced by David. Uh, this is the RepRap printer, which is sat on my desk, currently not working so well. So. Uh, David's kindly agreed to come, come along and give me a hand fixing it up. Uh, but a, a nice little claim to fame, my, uh, my colleague back in Bath was uh, Adrian Bowyer, uh, the inventor of this device and the starter of this project, and he was actually my uh, examiner of my PhD. Um, but here's some examples of some of the components that can be uh, produced from the RepRap device. Now, I ran a, a project last year on design for assembly, so how can we make redesign this printer to make it more easy to assemble. So they redesigned some of the brackets uh, to make them easier and quicker to put together, used the design to print them off, and then tested them. And they tested them by basically taking the two uh, versions, the previous version and the new version, and timing how long and quick it was to put together. And they also modeled the learning rates of assembly. So by doing this, they could prove from the new prototype that it was quicker and easier to assemble than the previous version. So that's what they use their prototypes for. 
What's this now? Okay, so if we take this, the example of the, the sun cream, um, what would we actually want to, a uh, small exercise for you now? We've talked about the market feasibility and tests that we can uh, look into the market feasibility. What might we need to test and prototype about the, the packaging and the product of the sun cream to produce on demand? Uh, and what tests could we do? I'd like you to discuss that in your groups for uh, five minutes. If you've got any questions regarding the exercise, put your hand up, I'll come and see you. Okay, take five minutes. Um, so rather than do that uh, exercise there, I think we just go on to our own designs. So instead, think about your own projects and think about what single prototype you would create and test to deal with the burning issue that you uh, discovered at the beginning of this seminar today. So if you're going to produce a prototype to test your own design, uh, project, what would it be? How would you test it? So can uh, would any team like to suggest how they'd like to prototype their product and what tests they would do to test some of the feasibility of their product? Well, I'm thinking there are three teams here which have physical products. Your team, your team, and your team. So I'm looking at you three in particular. Okay, yeah, yours too. So which, who, do you want to yeah. take this down? We're thinking we'll make a plasma model um, and uh, use it for testing the, the overall impression of the product. Um, the feel of the product, and then we'll make a, uh, an ugly but functional uh, prototype for uh, testing the uh, technical functions. Okay. And what technical functions? If it works. Okay. So how would you decide if it works or not? Um, use experience. Do they feel pain when they inject or do they, or don't they? So that means you have to actually get people to use it with the injection. We'll use it on ourselves, and we will, uh, we have a couple of, uh, of people in mind that uh, would like to have us. Okay. I suspect you could do a better experimental setup than that to test some of these uh, these factors. Um, for example, if it's uh, this project here, just to remind people, is uh, uh, a device to clasp skin together so that you can inject and always have the same skin fold. Now, the proposal is they do a, a prototype so that they can test whether people actually feel pain when they're injecting. But perhaps we could do something a step back, which is just testing on people to see whether it always grips the right amount of skin. And therefore, we don't have to get people to inject. We can just use friends and family to, to be holding. And then we can use different body shapes and sizes as well. So there's, there's different ways of going about the testing. Uh, maybe have a little bit more of a th uh, think about it. Any other groups? You guys? How are you going to test your device? Okay. So how are you going to test whether it works or not? How are you going to use your functional prototype to test? Um, I think that we will go to our thought is good to be time and then try for at first we'll try it with our own things and then afterwards we'll try it with okay uh, but what are you going to record what what will the data be to show that it's worked or it hasn't worked or okay so you're going to actually find edema of sufferers and then test it real time to see whether it works or not yeah. It takes a couple of weeks, so it's uh, a yeah, long process. Okay. Do you think there's a, a stage before of functional prototyping or proof of concept prototyping, such as can you just get a normal person to rest their foot on it and see if it moves it up and down? That's our first, the third, first thing we'll do. Just okay. fire so all your projects, you'll, you'll have stages of questions on the way to the final feasibility of it. I think this week, 
now is your opportunity to get these prototypes made and drawn up. But really think it through. Think about the entire experiment. What questions are you asking? What data are you gathering? What are you proving? It's not just, let's produce a functional uh, uh, proof of principle prototype to test if it works. That's not enough. You're testing what aspect of it working. What data are you doing? How is it going to prove one way or another? So th I think this is pretty much it now, guys. This is, this is the week you have to do this. So you have Friday. Send off your drawings. Uh, it will possibly get produced the following week. Maybe you've got a little bit of time to uh, evaluate the prototypes, maybe use them a little bit, and then it goes into your final business plan, your presentation. So you really have to make this week count with, with regards to prototyping and testing. Uh, any quick questions regarding uh, technical prototyping? Okay. I think we'll have to move on. So we haven't got a huge amount of this uh -huh. oh. Okay, I'll just hold this. It's all right, I'll just hold it. It's fine. Um, so to give you a, a course roundup, and I'd like your inputs as well. I'd like to uh, open the discussion. Uh, bear in mind, I'm not examining you. It's the external examiner. So if you thought it was hopeless and a complete waste of your time, you're welcome to say it, um, and your marks won't be affected. Um, so the aim of the course was to try get you, well, to push you a little bit further down the line of development. So instead of just doing uh, sort of make-believe exercises and using methods and tools to actually think whether this is really feasible or not, to really push you to say, can we actually make a business from this? And if not, be honest and responsible with yourselves to change direction, kill ideas and try to get something that's actually working. Um, hopefully it'll have given you an appreciation of the important factors of new product development. Um, and learning from success and failure of your own projects and other people's projects. Obviously, working with teams is an important aspect. The fact that you only have these two, two periods a week together and then you have to split off and do separate work packages. And I suspect those teams who haven't worked as individuals as well will not do as well as the groups that have done. It's also, and, and this is partly uh, Jakob's uh, motivation and drive was to create an entrepreneurial community. So make sure that it's nice to see somebody with the Startup Weekend t-shirt there, uh, getting involved in the Venture Cup, uh, going to external lectures, going to the CBS case competition and realising you're not alone. This is how entrepreneurs and startups work. It's engaging within this community and support network and you won't do it on your own. Um, and then also to develop products in an integrated manner, in an IPD manner. So it's not just about developing the product or the production system. You really have to think about all elements of the product together. If any of them are out of place, the product and the business won't work. In my quick evaluation, some of the things that we could have perhaps done better, I, in retrospect, I should have introduced you to the business canvas. So the kind of business canvas template would have helped you perhaps record your business ideas in an easy manner and show in how you iterate between your business ideas rather than it being a little bit more chaotic as you might have experienced. Um, we could have perhaps been a bit more prescribed in the idea generation sessions. Um, really what I, what I observed was every week was a process of thinking about it a bit more and slowly iterating through, whereas maybe we should have had slightly more dedicated sessions, as in today we're doing nothing but generating ideas based on this, uh, this business principle and trying to do as many ideas as possible the next week, trying to select and evaluate and moving on stages. Um, I also think related to this point, uh, my observations were we perhaps had too many laptop sessions Nearly every time I came around to a group, everybody's face was in a laptop. <clears throat> and of course, I have no idea what you do when you're not in the group sessions. Maybe that's when you do all your creative work. Um, but the way design companies work 
uh, innovation hubs work is they'll sit around a table, large pieces of paper, and it will be as many ideas as possible in two hours. Record every single idea, then select seven of them, develop those further, record them, select and develop. Whereas I don't think some of the groups had that divergence of ideas, that huge breadth of ideas that we might have experienced if we'd have had some dedicated sessions to laptops away, come up with as many ideas as possible. So I think that's how I would change the course if I was going to. Um, yeah, as I say, uh, cataloging and developing. Um, and then perhaps this lecture on prototyping could have come earlier, or the option or ability to produce mock-ups could have come earlier. And that would have helped you validate and quickly iterate through your, uh, your feasible solutions quicker. Those are my thoughts on how the, the court went. Um, I'd like to hear your opinions. Go ahead. Um, sometimes I think it, there was a long period of time from today's lecture and then Friday afternoon group section, uh, session. Mm -hmm. so it would have been nice to have like an entire day of doing this course so you have the lecture and fresh mind when you actually sit down and do the group session. Okay, that's an interesting point. Actually, <clears throat> when I was thinking about the course, next year it's probably going to be the full day on the Wednesday. I actually thought the opposite. I thought you need two meeting points a week to be able to meet up, do individual tasks, meet up again on the Friday, then do individual tasks. If you just have the one meeting point a week, I just thought it might not be as good, but valid point. Yeah, I, don't know, I think this happens with every course, but on campus now, there's a lot of lectures, a lot of PowerPoints. The way they're labeled, it's kind of, trying to look for something specific. I mean, you had a PDF of different crowdsourcing websites, for instance, on the first couple of, and you have a you know, label by one, by two, by three, four, and all that. Sometimes it can be, I mean, there's so much there, it's kind of hard to find information. So is that specifically about the PowerPoints, too much information on the no, PowerPoints? No, I mean, just trying to find the information later. Okay. Uh, a few weeks later, maybe, oh. if there's, maybe if there's some sort of label, it's labeled differently or something. Okay. In accordance with that, your homepage is quite messy. Um, what are you talking about? There's been some, <laughs> there's been some problem like figuring out when we ask to do what in accordance with the time schedule. So, okay. um, but that's mine, I need to. No, no, I think that's very valid. Uh, I think that's partly to give myself an excuse. This is the, the first time this course has been run, so I haven't got the benefit of hindsight. Um, and it was slightly organic. We were reacting on where you were and developing it as we went along. But yeah, very good point. I think it's nice that we have been pushed towards CBS and uh, startups, that kind of stuff. But uh, as you say, startup is, is a mix of people. And <coughs> here we are in groups of basically mechanical people. And it doesn't work out. Yeah. And that would be nice if it could be fixed, if we could do some kind of integration between universities or, or just other places around D2. You have this story. Are you recording this, Georgie? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. I've, I've just received a, a decent sized grant to do that. So in 2013, I'll be integrating this course with Copenhagen University and CVS. Um, so I, I completely agree with you. Unfortunately, it's just part of the design innovation program, and you're all kind of a little bit similar, but I, I still think you did most of your groups did remarkably well about looking into the different areas and, and trying to diversify your skills. But uh, you're absolutely right. And about planning, but I think there was a period with really many people who were planning and 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 planning one of the reasons I wanted to do some of the pitches was to give yourselves an idea on where your kind of your group's ability is at the moment. You get to see how other groups are progressing, what their problems are, and learn from each other a little bit. It also gives you an idea of, okay, we're doing pretty well, we're quite far ahead, oh, we really need to buck our ideas up. Um, but I actually I felt the same way. I think we are slightly pitch heavy 
um, and maybe that's not one of the, the real major core competencies we want to develop in this course, but I do think it's very important. And also, I would say forcing you at certain points of the process to do a pitch means you have to gather and collect your thoughts. So it's not just this whole mess and raveling constantly. You have to take stock and say, well, where are we in this project now? Uh, what is our current state and situation? So I think, although it does seem quite a lot, it also had other benefits to it as well. Uh, two things. First of all, I think it's a good thing that we did so many pitches, just because you gather your thoughts about around the project and you streamline your, your information, so I like that. And the second thing, wasn't we supposed to get some sort of mentor advice at some point? Who has had uh, contact from a mentor? We're having a meeting next Okay. Who hasn't had contact from a mentor then? Okay. Um, could you just uh, give me a note down the front? I spoke to the Venture Cup and they, they assured me they'd assign... Oh, you've, you've been speaking to the uh, people from the Venture Cup though, haven't you? Yeah. If you haven't at least received an email from someone from the Venture Cup about mentors, come and leave your name at the front. If you have received an email, just follow it up and say, we'd really like a meeting with our mentor ASAP. Um, it's a shame it's coming right at the end of the, the project, but um, you know this is a, a facility that is essentially charity to you. Uh, we can't expect it, but um, I'd like for you to be able to meet with the mentors anyway. Uh, I'll take one more point. Go ahead. Uh, I think it has to be a really good course. It has to be a really eye-opener on how difficult it is to be a startup company. Okay, thank you. I really think because we are trying a lot of things and a lot of the points you mentioned in the different lectures is very relevant and showing how difficult it is to move from an idea to a product or a concept or whatever. Okay, well... I think I'll uh, stop the, uh, the points on that very positive, constructive comment. Uh, also, the superstar volunteer, I mean, bear in mind when Jaco came to this course, he was doing it completely pro bono, just because he loves the topic and he's really interested. And I could certainly not have delivered this course anywhere near to the level if it wasn't for Jacob's input. So. Uh, I think we all owe Jacob a really big round of applause and appreciation. <laughs> and uh, we ended up employing him after this as well, so uh, it's not all bad for him. Um, and I would say thanks to all you lot. Um, I'll really remember this course. Uh, I had quite a lot of fun doing it. I thought you were fantastic in the lectures. It's great inviting people over, knowing that you're not going to be stony silence. You'll engage with the external lecturers. You engage with each other. I think you really embraced a lot of the course. And uh, so I thank you all. And I thought you did a really good job this term. Uh, so give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Any final questions before we uh, wrap up? Okay, enjoy your lunch and good luck with the uh, pitches. <laughs>